And with all that, Ellie Mistal is a legal analyst and justice correspondent for the nation, covering the courts, the criminal justice system, and politics. He also writes the magazine's monthly column, Objection. He is Alfred Nobler Fellow at the Type Media Center, a frequent guest on MSNBC and Sirius XM, and a legal editor of the More Perfect podcast on the, or More Perfect podcast on the Supreme Court for Radiolab. Mistal is a graduate of Harvard Law, a former associate at De Beauvoir in Plimpton, and a lifelong New York Mets fan. And I think his own words, one of those things is not like the others. Prior to joining the nation, Mistal was the executive editor of Above the Law, a website offering a behind the scenes look at the world of the, of the law. Uh, Sean Scott is a Seattle based writer and historian, a former Pramila Jayapal staffer and Bernie Sanders 2020 field director. He is currently the policy lead at the statewide Poverty Action Network. He is the author of the paperback Millennials and the Moments That Made Us, a cultural history of the US from 1982 to the present, to the present, I should say, and a forthcoming hardcover from UW Press about sports and the progressive movement in America. Ellie Mistal's book, Allow Me to Retort, a Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution is, as of yesterday, I think I could be wrong, officially ensconced on the New York Times bestseller list and coincidentally the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Sean Scott and Ellie Mistal. Where, uh, thank you so much. I can hear the, the digital rounds of applause ringing, ringing through here as we, uh, we, we get together to talk over Zoom. Ellie, it's great to be with you as well. I can't wait to get into um, your book, Allow Me to Retort. Um, my first question is really actually going to kind of pivot off of something that Ware had asked or Ware had um, talked about in his introduction, which is the land acknowledgement. Um, we are sitting and talking, um, at least those of us who are in town hall, um, on the on the uh, seated grounds of um, the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. Ellie, you write in your book, uh, to understand eminent domain, you have to appreciate that if you start from first principles, all land is public. All land is just there, owned only by whoever and whatever happens to be standing on it and can physically defend it at a particular time. Um, one of the first things that the Seattle City Council here in the city of Seattle did in 1865 was illegalize the presence of Native American peoples um, in the city. So my, my question really, Ellie, um, to kick us off here is, you know, the, the establishment of the, the settler colonial state is really long running and deep seated, just like the legal tradition in the United States itself. So what made you want to issue this retort um, by delving into this tradition, which has been so um, fraught and traumatic and unjust in so many ways historically and presently? A great question. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you so much um, to Town Hall for, for hosting this event. Yeah, so why did I want to dive in and dive in on that point in particular? Because of the unfairness. Because of the unfairness and because of the way that people accept the unfairness as if that was the only way to go. And it simply was not. So when we talk about something like eminent domain, yes, as I explained in the book, ancient right. I mean, you just, just can scarcely think of a civilized society without eminent domain. Like, I mean, we're talking about like from Hobbes, from anything outside of the state of nature probably has this concept, right? But how it is applied and who it takes what from, that's entirely new. That's kind of, that, that's relatively random. The idea even that there is a private property to be taken, that's relatively new, right? That we had to have, you know, an entire treatise on government Government, like the only one that anybody's ever read, John Locke's treatise on government, to actually justify why there should be private property at all, right? And then how how the government is able to take private property and who it takes it from is an error is an area of some contention, right? So as we are mentioned, I'm a Met fan. I'm from New York, Long Island, in, in particular. I'm kind of you know I'm a product of the East Coast, and so I am you know, very I grew, grew up being familiar with the story of the Dutch purchase of the native land of Manhattan, which by the way, used to mean place of many hills. If you can imagine Manhattan as a hilly place, like that's what it meant, right? And the story as it was passed down to me, and I went to relatively you know, progressive education schools or whatever, was that the Dutch didn't, you know, the, the, the natives didn't understand, the Lenape people didn't understand these concepts of private property and the, the evil Europeans just kind of pulled a fast one on them. No, no the natives did understand concepts of private property. It's just that the deal that they thought they were making with the Dutch was like a lease, right? It was a cohabitation of this island and its resources. It was the Dutch who didn't understand the deal. It was the Dutch 
who didn't who didn't kind of respect the traditions of of the people and converted against their will the lease into a purchase and converted the exclusionary um, aspect of their deal to exclude the people who they thought the, the who who the natives thought that they were going to share the land with. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about something like eminent domain, we have to understand that at pretty much every point in the new world, at least, it has been used to displace vulnerable people, minority people, um, as opposed to, um, as opposed to maybe not the exact right word, I'll go this way. It has been used to displace vulnerable people as opposed to displacing powerful people. That's what we see time and time again, not just in Manhattan, not just in Seattle, but all across this country over all sorts of things. I mean, uh, as, the, as, as we were talking about, I mean, you're writing about sports in the modern and in, in our modern society. We know that right now, one of the most displacing things that can happen is when the billionaire sports owner demands a new billionaire playhouse for their sports franchise, right? What's the government going to do? They're going to go in, they're going to take land from somebody, they're going to give it to the billionaire owner as a as their plaything, right? And the people whose land they're going to take, it's not going to be you know nice suburban you know well connected community. It's going to be a poor or working class community that gets that has their land stripped out from under them to make room for a billionaire's playpen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and and you're so right that it is a story that I think is manifestly clear, uh, all puns intended, coast to coast and in the United States. I first came across your work, Ellie, the column that you wrote um, that was called Return to the Joys of Full-Time Office Work, speaking of displacement, Return to the Joys of Full-Time Office Work, no thanks, um, about sort of all the micro and macro aggressions that um, working people, especially working people of color, encounter in professional white, white and white collar settings. Um, so I wanted to ask, honestly, at this stage, as we are going into the junior year of this pandemic, how are you doing, number one, and in, the, in a wave of worker unrest as well, why do you think it is that so many politicians and business owners are so eager to have folks return to the office willy-nilly? Rent. Mm -hmm. They want them rents, right? They want, like, they've, you've got extremely wealthy people paying very high office rents for empty offices and they want to justify that office space. So they're trying to force people back into the office who, in many situations, don't want to go. Now, again, we look, the, the, the pandemic has, has, has kind of been felt on two different tracks, probably more like, you know, eight different tracks, right? But for the, in broad strokes, two different tracks, right? One, you had an essential job, right? You, your job was important. That probably meant, A, your pay was not, right? If you, because we, 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 I think we've seen through this pandemic that we don't actually pay our essential workers what they're worth, right? So you had an essential job, a job that you had to do in person for relatively, in the grand scheme of things, low wages. So you had to go in. Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, we went on lockdown March 2020. You were back in the office April 2020 if you had an important job in this country, right? Then we had everybody else who pretty quickly figured out that you could do, and usually your more higher paying job, you could do that from home. You could do that remotely. You could you had structures in place that allowed you to, to kind of perform your essential functions without putting yourself at risk um, of the virus. And lots of people who had that opportunity did that. Well, eventually it's it's the middle managers of those people that kind of were shown to be useless, right? Like it's turns out you don't need to be breathing down the neck of some you know office worker 24 7 to get the maximum productivity out of them right so now you need to justify your job and to justify their jobs that's kind of how you started that first wave of moving people back in um, uh, um and it's just kind of snowballed from there where am i right now look i'm a writer i've always worked from you know even in the before times i worked from home like three or four days a week right so like being a writer is a very solitary, kind of staring into your navel and wondering why you suck kind of experience. <laughs> um, so there's not, no skin off my nose, right? But I've got kids. Right. And, and, you know, as you know, you, they, the, the benefits of in-person school versus at home. School, and we have all of the, you know, all of the middle class accoutrement, right? We have the iPad and the laptop and the one room for the one kid and another room for, we had everything going for us and it was hell. It was still, you know, not the best possible educational environment for my now nine-year-old and now six-year-old, right? So like them going into in-person school was a big deal, but you want them to be as safe as possible 
when they are going to their schools. Now we're very lucky. Our school up again, up in the suburbs, it's a big space. They could they they could keep it down to like I think it was like eight or nine people in a pod. And you know, they, they had all these things that could protect them. But for a lot of families, going back to public school meant putting your kids at risk to the virus and to bringing home the virus. Um, and now we're, we're in a situation where, where, where people are bored of it. They want to, and so we're kind of going towards um, masklessness again in schools. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things that people should know is that kids, are, kids can adjust, right? My nine-year-old thinks that wearing a mask is normal at this point. Like literally during the State of the Union, where he's, he's, he's talking, we were talking about Biden's, you know, decision that we're gonna go off mask. And my nine-year-old says to me, Daddy, I don't think the President Biden knows how easy it is to wear a mask because <laughs> he's used to it now, <laughs> right? That's what right. kids do. Um, but, you know, Florida, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but Texas, but, you know, people don't want to hear, don't want to hear that message. And so we're moving ex ex exonerably towards uh, mask free uh, ways. Uh, and we just, you know, I'm just praying that keep that, that kids are, that my kids are healthy first and foremost, and that right. everybody else's kids are healthy as well. Right. Absolutely. So in the, the opening lines of your book, and it's one of the things I appreciate so much about your work as you share it on the written page, um, and also as you share it in person, so to speak here with us is, is just the fact that you really don't pull any punches. So you come right out of the gate, the first few lines of your book, our constitution is not good. It is a document designed to create a society of enduring white male dominance, hastily edited in the margins to allow for what basic political rights white men could be convinced to share. The Constitution is an imperfect work. You go on to say, um, video gamers would have called the Bill of Rights a day one patch, and they're a good indication that the developers don't have enough time to work out all the kinks. So at the same time that this is extremely, um, an extremely realist and realistic interpretation of this, this so-called founding document, I also detect a lot of optimism there, right? Because it's, it's, you're not saying it's imperfect and it can't be improved upon. You're not saying that this was written in, um, you know, it was written when it was written in the social context in which it was written. And that's just kind of the end of the discussion. I think I read you in not only this passage, but in subsequent passages in your book as saying, um, just like what you were saying earlier, it really is on, on a lot of us who are living in the present, who are still fighting in the present, that are still delving into this history in the present um, to do better than the past. So do you feel, as you are you know, somebody who's going about writing and speaking and working about the topics that you do, fundamentally optimistic, or does optimism not even enter into it for you? Is it, is it about just the reality part of it? Diagnosing what is as opposed to saying what should be. Yeah, I mean, look, I've never been accused of being an author of this. I mean, like, that's, not, that's not usually my bag. So I would, I would, I would, you know, pride myself on being in the realistic camp. Camp, but being realistic about the Constitution does include a level of optimism because you you can see what it could be, right? So I've actually been kind of surprised that 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 particular line has been so controversial. Like, the, yes, the the very first line of my book is the Constitution is not good. The very last line of my book is, I'm here to tell you that the Constitution is trash, but it's Republicans who say that it always has to be. Right. And, and that is the frame for my entire analysis. Yes, what we have done to this point has been less than stellar. I do not think it is a controversial point even to point to, to, to notice the failures of the Constitution and the failures of who we've allowed to interpret the Constitution and tell us what the Constitution means. But at the same time, I happen to believe in a document that can be improved both physically, like the, 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 nut, the nuts and bolts of it, like structurally, we can improve the constitution through the amendment process. But even more than that, we can improve the, the, the lived experience of the constitution by appointing and electing better people to interpret what these documents mean. If you're gonna tell me that the document was written by slaveholders, um, colonists, and white people who were willing to make deals with slaveholders and colonists, then the very, and we're not gonna throw it out. We're not gonna just set it on fire and try again. Then the very least we can do is have the document be interpreted by a diverse group of people 
always towards increased justice, increased fairness, and increased equality for all. That's the very least that we can do if we're going to call this experiment that we're all engaged in legitimate, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of patently and obviously illegitimate to tell me, a Black person in 2022, that not only was this document written by people who captured my people, but now, even in the 21st century, I have to, my, my rules and my freedoms are cabled to the best ideas that those captors had in the 18th century. Like, that's, that's stupid on its face, right? Come on. I'm like, that's not, that's not a real argument, right? I'm not, I'm not really going to do that, right? So either we acknowledge that the constitutional basis is poison. And needs to be and it needs that needs to be extracted from the from the American experience, or we're going to say that the entire exper experiment is illegitimate. Mm -hmm. I like to say I'm not a black nationalist. I'm not a black radical because I don't believe that the entire experiment is Ill is 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 irrevocably um, damaged. I think it can be improved if we would just allow a greater group of people and more diverse group of people get get uh, uh, have a say in improving it. And I think that really comes through when um, you you draw this parallel between the law and jazz. When you say the law is not science, it's jazz. It's a series of iterations based off of a few consistent beats. Um, you know, we're I'm I'm sitting here talking to you, obviously from from Seattle, where um, a lot of people don't think of I think Seattle as as what I'm about to describe it as, but I think it's as much a part of the city's history as as anything. The fact that um, your book is titled, Allow Me to Retort, I think just on the face of it is um, a response to a broader debate set of conversations that are happening um, with respect to critical race theory in specific. One of the architects of the attack on crit critical race theory is actually a homegrown product of Seattle, Christopher Rufo, um, who's very, very deliberate in selecting CRT. Um, what they call CRT as a as a sort of a target for a right wing war on critical thinking, in general. So I would I would ask you this: as somebody who's been writing and speaking about these issues, if you could tell liberal and progressives something about how it is exactly that right wing radicalism of the sort that you've been sort of describing sort of foments and incubates um, and finds its expression, what would it be? Because I think there are a lot of people that would be surprised to find out that. Um, you or I would not be, but I think many might be surprised to find out that a liberal northern haven like Seattle was actually um, the social context in which one of the one of the, the primary architects of the war on critical race theory sort of cut his teeth. Um, so what would you say to liberals and progressives about how it is that right wing radicalism is sort of fomenting and incubating in spots where um, that we think of as very progressive? Um, if you ever seen the movie, uh, Remember the Titans? Uh, there, there's, there's a scene that, that I love, right? The, 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 the Titans are being, are being hamstrung by the referees. The referees are trying to, trying to uh, uh, get the, throw the game, right? Um, and the white coach, Ned Yost, he, he, you know, he says, you're going to call this game fair. And then he gets the whole defense together. And he's like, I do not want them to gain another yard. You blitz every down. That's why I wrote the book. That's what I want liberals to do because that's how you beat these people. You do not seed a yard. You blitz every down because that's what they're doing at you. Chris Ruvo is not what Chris is the architect of this current attack on Chris Procris theory, and he has he has been he has been honest about how intentional he's been with it. Right? He's not even trying to hide the ball. The, 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 the Democrats seed so much legal, intellectual, and moral ground to patently ridiculous and bad arguments from the conservative wing of this country, right? And we need not seed it, right? So we, I, I talk a lot in my book about abortion, for instance, right? And that's, that, that is a word that there are some liberals who won't say that word. Mm -hmm. Like there are literally presidential candidates and presidents on the Democratic side who won't say the word abortion because they think it scares people. Are you kidding me? Conservatives treat the abortion issue as if they are trying to stop a baby holocaust. And Democrats treat the abortion issue, some white male liberal Democrats treat the abortion is issue like they're super embarrassed and they just think it should be safe, legal, and rare. That, that's all they want to say. Are you kidding me? 
I, in my book, I explain how the, the right to an abortion should be understood under the right to privacy, which is a extension of the substantive due process clause of the 14th Amendment. If you don't like that, I say it can be justified under the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment, because men and women should have the same access to the reproductive rights. If you don't like that argument, I say it can be justified under the Eighth Amendment's ban against cruel and unusual punishment. And if you don't like that, I say that it can be justified under the 13th Amendment's ban against forced labor because forcing a woman to carry a baby to term against her will for free is outlawed under the 13th Amendment. It's unconstitutional under the 13th Amendment. So I do not say that, oh, I am pro-choice. I say forth, forced birth is bad and not something a legitimate government can engage in. That is blitzing every down. That is not ceding a yard to these bad faith conservative arguments, right? You can talk about gay rights where the conservatives are like, oh, well, we have a, we have a fundamental religious belief that marriage is between a man and a woman. I don't give them that crap. There's no fundamental religious belief. Nobody's asking you to get gay married. Nobody, hey, bake a cake. Nobody's asking you to jump out of the cake during the wedding and say, I love gay people. Nobody's asking you, asking you to accept money for services you went into business to render. Take the money. That's not, you don't have, can't have a religious objection to taking money that you went into business to make. So right. again, do not cede intellectual ground to these people. That's how you fight them. So I wanna encourage folks as we, we get on with our discussion to um, drop in questions at the, the tail end of our conversation here. I wanna pull a few audience questions as well. Um, what you mentioned um, there about, about blitzing every down sort of comes through in the, the urgency of your prose. I mean, right, even if you look at the titles of some of the chapters, right? Chapter one, canceling trash people is not a constitutional crisis. Chapter four, stop frisking me. Chapter 14, reverse racism is not a thing. Chapter 16, you simply title the abortion chapter as if by the time we get to chapter 16, you're like, you could probably guess by this point how I think about this, um, how I think about this topic. So my question for you is this, when you sit down to write, what kind of music do you listen to if you listen to music? And what are some of your literary and creative influences that you draw on um, in crafting your prose and in formulating this book and, and just trying to you know, make the subject come off with your words? All right, so we'll start with my process. My process, I would not recommend to anybody. It's it's a it's a, it's a violent process. What I, I I take my hate, I take my rage, I I take myself and I kind of twist myself into the tightest knot that I can twist, and then try to explode it onto the screen. I mean, that's 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 the kind of that's the visualization of what I'm doing. I'm kind of trying to take all of that energy, that pent up energy, and then just punch through the screen with it. Um, and that's how, that's my process. So it's kind of, it, it can, when it works, it's great. When it doesn't work, it's kind of like I burn the house down, right? So it's, <laughs> it's, it's very intense and, 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 and that, that's the downside, but it is, it is energetic, I think at least. In terms of my writing heroes, I mean, you have so many. So like, I mean, look, the, it's, I, I, I resist saying this because it's so cliche, but like James Baldwin kind of did all the things, right? Like J James Baldwin's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not just righteous indignation, which lots of people have and you love, right? But just like there's a, James Baldwin had a disrespect for the racist mm -hmm. that I have, that I found very comforting or, or, or admirable when I was, when I was coming up, when I was being educated, because I think a lot of, Black, and I'm not disparaging other, you know, any, anybody else, um, certainly nobody in particular, but I think a lot of Black authors, a lot of Black people in public, we have adopted a sense of like, you're trying, like you're trying to work it out with them, right? You're trying to bring them along to understand, you're trying to, trying to not appease the racist, but kind of explain things to, to, to a white racist in terms that the racist will kind of be able to understand and, and, and you know, maybe have some enlightenment. And Baldwin was like, I, it's not for you. Like he, Baldwin would engage in the debate, but like the debate wasn't for them, right? It wasn't, it wasn't, he wasn't trying to make them feel nice about themselves. He wasn't trying to coddle or comfort them. And I really liked that I needed that at some level um, when I was, when I was going through my own past. So obviously he's, he's number one, but I take my influences from a lot of places. I mean, I, I, I mean, people are going to find this funny, but like Bill Simmons, especially like old school, like old ESPN page two Bill Simmons, right? One of my favorite writers, right? Because he wrote about 
sports from the perspective of a fan, right? He wrote it. He wasn't an inside baseball guy. He was an outside baseball guy talking about it in the way that regular people talk about it. I bring that to my own writing. At least I try to, right? I don't want to talk about the, I don't want to talk. And if you read the book, you'll see it's very little jargon in the book. I'm not trying to, I wasn't trying to write a law book. I was trying to write a book about concepts that people have experienced in ways that people can understand it about, yes, something that's fundamentally complicated, but in a very accessible way. I learned that from people like Bill Simmons or, or Keith Oberman, right? Like you get the, the humor from, from the Ralph Wiley, like these sports writers, right? You, you, you re they really understood how to take, you know, technical ideas about zone defense Mm -hmm. But in a way that everybody could understand, I always, I always really appreciated those writers. And then, you know, I read a lot of fiction writers just because, you know, it's, 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 that's literally, that, that's my hobby, right? So I'll read a lot of science fiction writers. I'm really into Brandon Sanderson right now with his um, uh, Wheel of Time series. So like, you know, those right. are, those are my influences. And, and certainly being a Mets fan, finding humor in the rage is an it's, important part of the moral fiber of being a, a fan of the Mets. Um, yeah, you can. <laughs> Without low nets, then there's there's no coming back, right? I I, I appreciate um really I really appreciate that explanation. I also note that you know the book for as accessible as you strive to be and as accessible I think as the prose is, it does not sacrifice rigor in the middle of that. So you have a section where you you're describing the Terry stop, for example, um and and you know sort of this experience that you had with law enforcement, and you sort of put a bow on part of the conversation by saying what I experienced was the vehicular version of what the lawmakers call a Terry stop. It's named after a seminal 1968 Supreme Court case, Terry versus Ohio. In an 8-1 ruling, the court found that the Fourth Amendment's protection against unreasonable searches and seizures still allows police officers to lay hands all over you if they had reasonable suspicion to stop you in the first place, right? So that's just one example, I think, of the way that you have of sort of, of summarizing doing really legal scholarship in a very, very concise sort of way. I found myself reading this section of the book in particular, wondering whether or not you considered yourself an abolitionist, whether or not you subscribe to the arguments of abolition, what your take on the discourse surrounding abolition, where it sounds, it feels like as recently as 20, you know, 18, 2019, there were very few people who called themselves abolitionists, those who were, were considered fringe to now you see people damn near put abolitionist in their LinkedIn accounts. You see it in like all sorts of places that would have been unthinkable previous to, um, you know, the new civil rights movement and moment that emerged over the last couple of years. So just where does, uh, where does Ellie Mistel stand on, on abolition? And do you so consider my, yourself one? Uh, probably not. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. So my, my story, my first, uh, uh, entrance into the that particular movement i'm actually on a root panel a panel with the with the with the publication of the root uh, talking about kind of one of the anniversaries of michael uh, brown's uh death and i'm on a panel with other black people and i'm doing my little thing and this mm -hmm. other black person starts making an abolitionist argument and i'm like there's a video of me just like my face would be like wait what you're you're just like just no just not having them anymore like that's your actual argument and they're like yeah and i'm like your, your ideas intrigue me. Where can I subscribe to your newsletter? Like, <laughs> like I haven't done any of the research or scholarship or anything um, until, until this one woman at the root. So like I, I, I uh, that, that, so I, I'm a, I'm a only, um, um, I'm only knowledgeable about it from like 2019 on in terms mm -hmm. of my own kind of research and experience where I come down though, is that we haven't yet tried holding cops accountable. So when we say that we have to defund because we cannot reform, that I pretty much agree with, except for the part where we haven't actually tried, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we could if we could construct a system where you had enough accountability and punishment, frankly, um, for misbehaving cops to change the entire nature and the, uh, of the police force and their entire relationship um, with people of color. But I know that we haven't tried it yet. And I kind of would love to give it a try mm -hmm. <laughs> before kind of completely saying that the entire system uh, uh, can't be saved, right? right. Um, the, the, in, in the book, I have three chapters kind of right together where I explain where if you let me change three Supreme Court cases. I mean, literally just three Supreme Court decisions. If you let me flip them to the dissent as opposed to the majority opinion, I can go a long way to stopping police brutality, man. 
<laughs> like I can take a lot of the bite out of it, right? Uh, you already mentioned Terry. Terry is the case that allows uh, cops to stop and harass people based on the color of their skin. Let's get rid of that. Let's say have no more Terry stops, all right? Um, uh, I talk about Graham v. Connor. That's the use of force case. That's the case that says a cop is allowed to use deadly force if a reasonable cop on the scene would also have used deadly force. Let's get rid of that. Let's change it to an objective standard. So the cop can't use deadly force unless objectively their life is in danger. They can't shoot you if they think you have a gun unless you objectively do have a gun. And if it turns out you had a water gun or a cell phone, you go to jail. No pass, go, don't collect $200, copper. Um, and then the, the cases involving qualified immunity. Let me change that so that even if the, if the police misconduct doesn't rise to the level of a crime, I can sue them civilly and take their house. So now you're giving me the ability to impoverish cops, to jail cops, and to prevent cops from stopping me in the first place. And let's try that. Let's, let's see if that kind of takes some of the bite out of the violence that we see on our streets. If that didn't work, and I could see, I could see a version where that didn't work, right. then yes, then, then, then I end up kind of full abolition. You know, look, there, as I say in the book, I can fix police brutality based on the rules that are already in the constitution even though the police came after the constitution there's mm -hmm. no constitutional kind of strictures on the police because the police are a later development than even our own constitution if they're that late in the game they can if they were done that late in the game they can be undone without without causing grave danger to the american republic but i'd like to try to hold them accountable first absolutely um, and thank you for that that explanation so much. So um, before we we start to turn it over, sort of here to to aud audience questions. And again, want to encourage folks to submit questions, and we'll use the latter part of our conversation to suss through those. We've had, um, I think, a pretty a pretty um, rich discussion up to this point that hopefully has provoked a lot of questions from folks. You have this um, the story that you tell about uh, Representative uh, Lazio. Um, who many people might know as the first creep to um, be a creep on a debate stage um, with Hillary Clinton before Trump. Um, Lazio, when they were running for, I believe that was the Senate race in 2000, approaches mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton with a, um, a document in the middle of a debate on stage, terrible optics, he tanks in the polls, end up, ends up losing. You sort of compare Lazio as somebody who, I think in the book, and correct me if this is an unfair portrait, I think you actually portray him as somebody who's actually kind of a reasonable mm -hmm. figure, not somebody who you would agree with politically as a Republican, but somebody who you, um, I think, look at as at least as a respectable enough person in an interpersonal setting. Contrast him with somebody like Rudy Giuliani, Trump comes up a couple of times. Um, he, so there are many people who might be on this call that if they're not, you know, Republicans themselves might have Republicans who were in their families. Um, and I guess the, the question that I have is sort of about the theory of power, right? Do we want to go, do you think it's fundamentally a better strategy with respect to building progressive and left power in this country to go in the direction of trying to convince folks? You alluded to how I think you might feel about this with the answer that you gave about, um, about James Baldwin, convincing folks that might be in the perceived center, or do you think the direction we really need to go in um, following a book that was written by uh, Stephen Phillips, I think it was an uh, Obama operative called Brown is the New White. It says we don't actually need to do about go about all this catering, go about all this trying to bring folks on board. We have enough of a base, enough people who already believe in progressive ideals, and they're tired of not being activated by a lot of folks who come around asking for votes. So in, in a scenario where that's an either or proposition, you definitely come down more on the side of we need to get people on board who are already there, get them activated, get them excited. Um, and it feels like this has real you know, ramifications on how this year might end up looking as an election year, right? 100%. So let's let's start from, from first principles. The, the reason why I end up on the side of let's just turn out our base is because the Overton window has shifted so far to the right that the center, that where the center is now is where the right wing was 20 years ago, right? Like a guy like Rick Lazio would present as a centrist now. He was a hardcore Republican back in the 80s. He hasn't changed. 
It's that the party has, the his party has lurched so far to the right that now a guy like Lazio looks like in the center. So one of the things that I try to get people to understand is that you cannot balance a seesaw if there's an elephant on one side of the seesaw and you're standing in the center. Mm-hmm. Right? You're just gonna, if you try, if, you, if there's an elephant on one side of the seesaw and you stand in the center, you're just gonna slide down to the elephant side, right? You can mm-hmm. only balance the seesaw by putting enough weight on the other side to, to actually balance it out, right? So that's, that's kind of conceptually, that's where I start, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in, in terms of, of, of your, your second question, in terms of how do we reach out? Well, again, I think what we've seen is that there are more of us than there are of them. The difference is that when Republicans get in power, they always throw their base something. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, this is why I wrote this book, a lot of times what they throw them are these Supreme Court nominations, right? So if you look, if you you go back in time in your head to 2016, Donald Trump running as an outsider candidate, an anti-establishment, you know, candidate, making fun of the Bushes, making fun of the Cruises, talking about Mexicans and disparagingly, you know, all these outsider things. When it comes to the Supreme Court, nope. Straight down the center with the Supreme Court. No, no, no. Republicans don't play when it comes with the Supreme Court. So Donald Trump had to release a list of Supreme Court nominees that was center mass Republican Federal Society approved nominees because Republicans do not play. Fast forward to 2020. Joe Biden is one of like 18 billion candidates running for president. You, know, you got you got Biden, you got Bernie, you got the coffee man, you got the mayor stop and frisk. You got you know, everybody was running for the Democratic nominee because Trump looks so beatable. Joe Biden in the, that race is one of the most conservative candidates when it comes to Supreme Court reform. You know, other Pete Buttigieg had a whole plan to 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 expand the court. Right, Bernie Sanders. I would be interested in a hundred uh, uh, justices. Like every other you know person had some was at least open to the idea of more. Not Joe Biden. Joe Biden was like, nope, we're gonna we're gonna nominate judges that I have. Maybe I'll have a commission to study it one day. Right, like because, that was his, and it right. didn't cost him a vote. Mm-hmm. Democrats do not lose by being weak on the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Republicans can't win without being strong on the Supreme Court. And that's why we have this asymmetry, right? And so one of the things that Republicans do when they get into power is that they throw their base some kind of, this kind of Supreme Court red meat. I don't think that the base Republican voter is any smarter than the base Democratic voter, but the Republican party has told the base Republican voter that everything the Republican wants, they can't get without the Supreme Court. So I can go to, uh, you know, to a truck stop in Arkansas and I can find a guy who's maybe who's a white guy who's but he's not racist. Right. He's he doesn't believe in white supremacy. He doesn't believe in white power. He just wants his guns. Mm-hmm. He just wants his guns and he's going to vote for the racist Mexican hating Trump. He's going to re- vote for the racist fascist Tom Cotton because he wants his guns because he knows there's a one to one connection between voting for those Republicans and getting his guns. You go to Democrats, you say, what do you want? You want gun regulation? You want climate change regulation? You want anything? Well, then you have to have the Supreme Court. No, we don't think like that. We think that we got to elect a a candidate. We got to elect a messiah. Maybe we got to do some stuff with Congress, but we don't make the one-to-one connection with our voters that everything we want, we don't get unless we control the Supreme Court as well. Right. So we have seen in recent years, you, you know, I'm really happy to see, to, to hear you describe um, for the audience sort of the deterioration of um, really, you know, honestly, just the, the extent to which um, Republicans and the right have sort of slid from whatever it was they were 25 or 30 years ago to what they are now. Um, and this next question I really think speaks to um, the increasing urgency of fighting back. The question, and I'm going to read it verbatim because I think it is very well phrased as well, is do you have fears over groups that are lobbying various states to have a constitutional convention in order to create an even more business-friendly and elite-friendly constitution? How much further do we have to fall is the, the vibe that I get off of this question. Do you have fears over groups that are lobbying states to create an even more business-friendly and elite-friendly constitution in the context where you can go back in 2015 or 16 and look at um, you know, Keith, I think it was Keith Ellison who was saying on MSNBC, you better look out, like Trump looks like he might be getting steam. All the, you know, anchor persons at that point in time laughed at him. 
Um, and the rest was history. So do, do you really feel like this is a, a real possibility with groups mobilizing and organizing to pull the constitution even further uh, right, if you will, than it was when it was written? Yeah, so I'm not worried about those people because they're already getting everything they want. Hmm. Like they're, they're like if, if if Democrats had won in 2016 and we had replaced Anton and Scalia with Merrick Garland and we had replaced Ruth Bader Ginsburg with Ketanji Brown Jackson, which is what would have happened had Hillary Clinton uh, won or had Bernie Sanders won that, or had you know uh, Martin O'Malley, who had anybody had any Democrat won in 2016, that would have been the next move. Um, and we had a 5-4 court and they were stopping these conservative crazy people, then yes, I would be more afraid about the conservative crazy people trying to, to, to have a new convention. But since they're already winning, I don't think that they have enough, you know, you don't, you don't have that kind of juice unless you're losing and they're not losing. The Supreme Court's about to give these people everything they say they want, right? Um, in fact, one of the reasons why I do not advocate for a constitutional convention, even though I think the constitution is trash and we could do a lot better. And I talk about countries like South Africa that have done a lot better in terms of reforming their document. I don't want one because unfortunately in this, in this part, in this period where we are in our country, I do not believe that we could have a constitutional convention that represented all the people. Right? If you gave me a, the option to have a convention where um, the delegation was based on population and representation as opposed to states' rights and you know what you know and and the delegate supported by the Koch brothers and the delegate supported by Disney and the delegate supported by C if you gave me a, a real constitutional convention I would be for it but we wouldn't have a real constitutional convention we would have this other kind of even more grotesque than the original one, probably um, conglomeration of corporate interests um, and 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 geographically um, uh, uh, distinct interests, as opposed to racially and uh, and economically distinct interests. And mm -hmm. so I think that it would go uh, go poorly. But I'm not afraid of them winning just at the moment because they're already winning. What I'm afraid of, I guess, to to kind of answer the spirit of the question, is that. The Supreme Court is about to give these people everything they want, and nobody seems arrayed to stop them, right? Like, they're, for a long time, people thought that, like, oh, well, the Supreme Court would never overturn abortion because there'd be protests in the streets. And I don't think the Supreme Court is worried about that. I don't think they're worried about protests in the streets. Yeah, maybe a day. Yeah, maybe it'd be a bad day at the court. But I don't think they're worried about, like, sustained national strike levels like they throw down in France. Mm -hmm. You know, and in fairness, we just got through an entire summer of Black people urgently demanding immediate redress of racial imbalances and injustices. And the Democrats won in large part based on that fervor. And once in power, the Democrats were like, nah. right? Like, where, where's my George Floyd Policing Act? Right. Where's my John Lewis Voting Rights Act? I didn't get any of that. And I'm not going to get any of that because the Democrats have, you know, so even in the, in the, even though they have, they stand on those, those shoulders of the people of that energy, um, mm -hmm. they haven't actually delivered. So I, I don't, I just, I'm not, a, I, I, what I am afraid of is that these mm -hmm. massive changes are happening in our country and so many of our people are asleep. Mm -hmm. right? You look at what happens in other countries. You look at, you know, when, 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 a when, a Puerto Rico got sick of their governor, right? I mean, there were people out in this just clogging the, the, the roadways for days, millions and millions of people. And we cannot consistently bring that heat mm -hmm. um, for these massive changes that are happening in our country. And that is scary because what, what the, the thing that authoritarians need the most is apathy. Right. Absolutely. And you do see that a lot, even, even here in Washington state where you had certain representatives at the state level that, you know, were able to get into office in our, you know, local election cycle in 2020, um, shortly after, you know, the movement coalesced in the streets. And in this most recent legislative session, actually many of them made the decision to roll back some of the same police accountability measures that they passed last year and that they ran on and won on. So it's a dynamic that has a lot of ripples, I think, both nationally and locally. Um, and it kind of pivots into this, this next question here, which is another really good one. Thank you so much to, to whoever submitted this. There seems to be a fundamental, I'm reading the question, there seems to be a fundamental disconnect between 
how liberals and leftists view power. How would you suggest we alter our game plan so that we can blitz on every down when half of our team wants to play prevent defense? I mean, for, let's just let's just be humble, right? Like if I had the answer to that, I'd be running for something, right? I'd be, <laughs> I'd be, I wouldn't be keeping it to myself for the hey. Zoom, right? I'd, I'd be blaring that out. So I, I, I obviously don't know how to motivate. And I think you put it exactly right. When half the team wants to play prevent defense, I don't know how you get around them, right? I don't know, you know, I have, you can kind of think about it tactically, like, oh, we should have, you know, done this before we did that. And we should have, you know, taken, taken this measure before we talked that measure. You know, it's the kind of like, does, does Kristen Cinema have cats? We should kidnap them and we and hold them hot, right? Like those, that's kind of where you get to um, with certain people, right? But in terms of, so tactically, we can always debate, but structurally, there's a problem there, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I go back to kind of the primary process. I go back to that sense that Republicans kind of, th there are games that Republicans always show up for that Democrats only sometimes show up for. Mm -hmm. And one of those games is the primary process where we consistently see Republicans, without a care of electability, electing their most rabid, kind of bloodthirsty, drooling uh, 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 versions of candidates and sicking them on the rest of the world, right? Nobody who voted for Marjorie Taylor Greene in a primary was worried about electability. Like, that, that wasn't, nobody asked about that. Nobody worried. Whereas Democrats, we're kind of constantly worried about this question of electability. And so all a all a more centrist, more moderate Democrat has to say is, well, you know, that one, that's not, I am electable. And never, oh, well, we have to make sure that we have the electable. When the, when the proof is that people who are able to start movements are the ones who are electable, right? Mm -hmm. People who are able to sustain um, energy and momentum turn out to be the people who are electable. But in, a, in, in our primary process, we, 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 we favor older candidates, our, our party, we have such a deep bench of young candidates, and yet our party is overrepresented with old fogies. Mm -hmm. uh, um, through, you know, at, not just at the national party, but like at all the state parties run the same kind of way. And so we have a real problem, I think, in the primary process of like getting our people to, to, to lock in. But part of that is because of the big tentness of the Democratic Party, right? And that's the other that's the other when, when I don't all I, sometimes I do want to step off the gas with the Democrats because the Republicans have the advantage of being a largely homogeneous party right mm -hmm. it's like this it's like the same three guys right it's like the guy from the Brooks Brothers catalog the guy <laughs> from the truck stop and the free thinking minority who just is getting off the plantation whatever that guy is right it's the same three guys right all the just just over and over and over again right right um and you know and the and and the and the what's the the dolores umbridge the woman is always dolores umbridge from the harry potter series right the, right the, that way right democrats we got we got everything we got everything from like ziggy from the wire to omar from the wire to everybody in between right. just all coming together and fighting it out none of us trust each other with good reason, you know, labor doesn't, you know, democratic labor forces don't trust liberal limousine, liberal donors with, with good reason. They don't agree, right? You know, East coast black Democrats don't trust Southern older black Democrats with good reason. We don't agree. Latinos don't trust any of us, you know, Latinos in Texas do not, you know, who are you know, coming from a completely different country, the Latinos in Southern California, none of them trust each other. And so we have all of these trying then to get us all together right. around you know, common, you know, we have common goals, but we have very different ways in our heads of getting to those goals. And that makes unity sometimes harder, which is why we kind of keep waiting for those savior candidates, right? Barack Obama, once in a generation, once in a lifetime type of politician, we keep, you know, John F. Kennedy, another one, right? And we keep waiting for those saviors who can kind of like, get the trust of all of our wings together. Um, and those people, they're great when they happen, but they're few and far between. Right. And, and often it's not, especially in the most recent iteration of, of what the Democratic Party often looks like. 
even when those folks sort of make it through the obstacle course that they need to make it through to represent the folks that they're trying to represent, they also are then faced with a lot of resistance internally um, from people that still have the electability argument with respect to people who've already been elected. Um, and that, that it turns out that that's, that's a problem because that will also, you know, make a lot of folks tune off from the process and not feel like it's, it's even worth the fight. Somebody's and, asked and, a question. You, you, yeah. you, it's, 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 the, it's making the argument on the street. You know, I, I tell Democrats this all the who Democrats who criticize me, why are you being so mean to Joe Biden? Well, because I want him to win. Right. And I've got, I'm the guy that's got to go into the barbershop. I mean, I don't go into the barbershop very often. often. <laughs> I was going to ask. <laughs> right? But when I do, I'm the guy who has to try to like explain at ground level why this guy that they voted for because they wanted police reform, because they wanted voting rights, because they wanted things to change, why nothing's changing. Right. I gotta explain that. I gotta explain what to, you know, I gotta explain to the guy who owns the barbershop why mm -hmm. the PPP money that should have gone to him instead of instead went to the New York Mets. I gotta explain that in my Mets cap. Right. right. Like that, that's a hard argument for me to make. Joe Biden right now, his poll numbers are like at 66% with black people. That's you can't be the president, you can't be a democratic president with 66% of the black support you just, just can't get it done right? right he was elected with 87 percent. he's down to 66 percent. he's got to pick up 20 percent. right so i i have some ideas for how he can pick it up but if he doesn't like my ideas do some other out but do something mm -hmm. because 66 percent ain't gonna cut it right, right. i want to win and that's the, that's what people don't always get with all of my arguments like i make these arguments because i want to win not because I want to be right. I already think I'm right. That's, you know, the, the ego does that for me, right? right? I make these arguments because I because I want to win. I believe these are winning arguments right. for, for a majority of American people, not for a majority of white people. Hey, look, the Democrats have lost, the, the Democratic candidate for president has lost the white vote in every presidential election since the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Folks, that's not a phase, all right? Like, them, <laughs> them brothers are gone, and they ain't coming back. So right. the Democrats have to kind of dance with the girl that brought them. And mm -hmm. the girl that brought them are women, minorities, um, religious minorities. Those, that, that's our base. And we have to start paying them off for their support. And it's, it's also the case, I think, in addition to what you say, that so much of the most inspiring and, and visible kinds of civic engagement that we have seen has come from folks who are in the labor movement, specifically in fields that as recently as 30 years ago when union density in this country was at an all time low in the 80s, I think it was down at about less than a quarter of workers being organized, folks who were in service work, white collar workers, folks who work in newsrooms. Um, those are really some of the most visible forms of, of asking for more and demanding more and, and asking for folks to do better. So I, I mentioned that to, to pivot into this next question where somebody has asked, um, I often feel fairly powerless as a citizen. I always vote and contribute what I can to progressive orgs, but beyond that, I don't know the best ways to have any impact. What do you, do you have suggestions for folks like me? So looking at, you know, all the different ways that one can be civically engaged, the ballot box, you know, once every, every, every four years for federal elections, I guess once every two years for federal elections, and we have our you know, odd year um, election cycles is another way of doing it. But, you know, the, the, the power doesn't only show up once in every four years in people's lives. It's a day-to-day -day, um, thing that people have to confront as working people, everyday people. So what are the ways that um, maybe you have found personally or that you have seen or taken inspiration from for folks to get involved civically um, that include voting, but also that supersede it? Right. So my father, I talk about this in the book, my father was a local politician um, for a long time. And because of that experience, one of the things that I learned is that these people really do care about their phone lines. You call these people, you leave messages with these people, you fill out their, their actual office phone lines, mm -hmm. they will listen to them. Local politicians will live and listen to every message. And even that, even your Congress people will listen to either personally listen to every message or certainly have a person who listens to every message. And if their phone lines are jammed up on one issue or the other, they're going to take notice of that. They kind of understand that the people who actually 
go all the way out to bother to call that the calling people are not only voters, obviously, if you're going to call, you're certainly going to vote, but you're the people that are going out there and telling your friends, telling your cousins, telling your people in your, in your communities and networks how to think and what they should be concerned about. So they care about those callers. So call call all the time right I, i'm on speed dial with my with chuck schumer and chris and chris and Gillibrand out here right <laughs> i'm always calling just to be like hey just just you know sometimes positively good vote good vote thanks thanks bye <laughs> right like call that that that's never underestimate calling never underestimate for your local politicians going when they have a town hall when they have an event on during the recess never underestimate going I always try to remind people we'd have we would have no health care we would Obamacare would have would have died if people did not bombard Republican Congress people when they went home during that first recess after Trump was elected because mm -hmm. they were going to kill it. Paul Ryan was you know had the knives sharpened and they cut it because there was too much outrage. Mm -hmm. um, so never underestimate going to those town halls as well. And then the, and then that leads to the obvious third thing: talk to your people. Mm -hmm. right? It's not like it, it, it's people aren't going to listen to me right i like look i'm on tv and like people aren't going to listen to me mm -hmm. they're going to listen to you so if you listen to me and you like what i said well then it's your job to go tell your people because they're not coming to listen to me they're not going to hear it from me i'm too black and too crazy for that you don't the list you're the one that's invited over thanksgiving right Right. You're the one that's invited over to the game. You're the one that's invited over to the baby shower. You've got to convince your people. My friends generally hate me because I'm always, <laughs> I'm always bringing up something, right? Like I'm, all, I'm always dissatisfied with something that they themselves are doing. You know, that they're not, you know, uh, 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 fighting hard enough or 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 or. To, uh, are trumpeting the cause loudly enough you know i saw I, i'll talk to my friends i saw you put that on facebook say you put that disinformation on facebook come on right. ellie it was a funny meme I mean, yeah it's funny to you how many people are gonna die from seeing that meme jimmy <laughs> not quite that i'm actually am that intense but like my friends right. expect that from me and right. so like that's that's my way to also have an impact you know you 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 change the people that are closest to you and it ripples out and the last thing i'll say about that I learned that from watching the most successful civil rights movement of my generation, the gay rights movement. Right. Right. Like the civil rights, the actual, the black civil rights movement, like that was before my, that was my mom's generation. That's mm -hmm. what they did. Right. But what I saw is within my lifetime, you know, the LGBTQ community go from being ostracized to, ha to, to, to a, a black president saying, I believe marriage is a man and a woman to within a term, I have evolved on that statement. Right? right, because the gay rights movement, you know what they started with? They started with their friends. The gay rights movement did not go start trying to get Republicans to agree with them. They started by getting Democrats to understand what the, what the deal was, right? right. And, and, to, and they started by not accepting bull crap from Democrats and bull crap from their friends. Mm -hmm. And that's how they got the ball. That's how they got the ball rolling. That's what we have to do progressively, I think, across a whole bunch of areas. Absolutely. So we're going to we're going to wrap here. It's been so great talking to you, but I wanted to ask you one last question. I can tell that you have Russell Wilson thoughts. You have black quarterback thoughts. You have thoughts about this trade that went down yesterday. And I think there might be a couple of folks on this call here in Seattle that might want to hear what your thoughts on that might be. I do. And it's positive. I think I'm, I'm a big like, thank you for your service. Right. They were not going to win another Super Bowl with him. Like the 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 that the the that that you, I can still see that pass in the air um <laughs> to that patriot court like that was the that was the high water mark and they weren't going to get back there let him go let him find another pasture and then you retrench and rebuild you know as a met fan as i as i keep saying i spent a lot of time watching players that were great have to move on to other pastures to be great <laughs> they, right. they weren't going to be great with us anymore um and then you just you, you you go positively and you reinvest in the next generation i think this was a great trade for seattle i don't know if it's a great trade for denver not yet but i think it's already a great trade for seattle ellie mistel thank you so much everybody please make sure to go buy and read allow me to retort um black man's guide to the constitution um, Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. And thank you so much, Town Hall. Um, thank you so much for everybody that submitted questions, stuck around to participate in this great conversation. This was awesome. Yeah, I'm Thank you so Town much, Hall. John.
I want to thank both of you so much. Thank you so much, Sean, for your moderation. It's always great to have you. Um, Ellie, you described yourself as not an optimist, and I would not uh, would not think to contradict that. You know yourself, but I do think your energy really uh, forces people to care. So um, thank you so much for, for being here. It's been really fun uh, hearing your conversation. Uh, Thanks, Kevin. I, I hope we'll have you in person someday. Absolutely. Cheers. Cool. All right. Have a great night. All right. Bye, guys.